But anyway, uh, they're going to be printing money for a lot longer than what they had said, and that means free money into the market. So, but uh, it just wasn't enough for the traders, was it? They went the other direction. This morning we had German manufacturing figures come out and that showed an increase, but the market ignored it because Mario let them down. Um, of course today also there's a bit of uh, negativity because we are waiting on non-farm payrolls. Yesterday unemployment figures, uh, unemployment claims, that is jobless claims from the US came out unchanged and uh, it looks as if the market is taking that as a sign to say that today's non-farm payrolls data are not going to be significantly better and therefore are not going to add more ammunition to the cause for a rate hike. Don't know where that reasoning comes from because Janet has already told us it's coming. In any event, that's what it seems to be and uh, as a result, it's all negative. Let's go see how much the market has fallen by. The FTSE is a third of a percent down, the CAC 0 0.6 and the DAX has lost half a percent. Joburg Olsey 1.6 in the red, industrials down by 1.8, financials by 1.9%. The overall resources index is higher, it's gained 1.3, but gold mining is down by 0.7%. And now this sounds quite uh, massive, platinum miners are down by 12%. But you've got to remember that they're coming from a low base anyway. Gold is at 1,061 per ounce, 856 for an ounce of platinum, and oil at 43 dollars and 20 cents. 14 rand 41 for a dollar, 21 rand 79 for a pound, 15 rand 65 for one euro, and then bricks versus the rand. It is okay. The yuan, yo, okay. We're paying a lot more yuans for a rand now. We are speaking to Ian Cruikshanks, he's chief economist at the SE Institute of Race Relations, and that's probably very appropriate, Ian, considering that we are talking economics today. Fitch. Yes. Um, let's start off with that one. It's obviously the big one. Are Fitch guaranteed to come? No, there's no such thing as a guarantee. And I think we have to bear that in mind. And don't forget that the markets have already discounted a, a slight worsening uh -huh. in that rating. So I think the reaction may not be too severe. Will they or won't they? Uh, I, I'd say that a lot of foreign investors have voted with their feet already. They have actually taken some of their funds out of, from South Africa, from the RAND arena. So perhaps most of the damage that could have been done has been done. Mm -hmm. What about SNP? Because they've already got us one above junk. Yes. Which has still got room to move to keep us yes. in investment rate at least. I think with S&P, what they can say, they had a stable outlook, they could say they were going to move to a negative outlook. Mm -hmm. That's sort of guaranteeing that the next move will be a cut. But that, I think they have that l tiny bit of margin uh, in order effectively just to stave off taking that, uh, the decision to that evil day. Now, here is uh, the rub. Um, yes. The world itself is in a rather negative state. Yes. And I don't think that the people at the ratings agencies will be unaffected by this. So do you think there might be an overreaction considering the negative state that the world is in? Wow. Uh, look, that's possible. But let's face it, we've been downgraded quite considerably mm. already during the past year or two years. And so they could say that, well, they've done a, you know, a lot of taking into account the changing situation we've had, especially since the, uh, the financial disaster we had in 2009. Yes. So uh, perhaps it, we'll just say it leaves time to leave space especially if we look at uh, how uh, the finance minister is managing affairs now, um, and they may say, look, it's not all doom and gloom, let's give them a little chance to see what happens in the next six to 12 months. The finance minister, you mentioned him, I'm sure that's to do with him speaking out. Yes, and, and that's a good point. That is just saying, look, we can't keep on offering guarantees and funding uh, and rescue operations indefinitely. It's got to be paid for. How do you pay for it? You take funds away from another source, another source of which should be infrastructure development or wherever it is, which slows down the potential for the economy to recover. So I think now, having been seen to stand up and say, no, we're not going to let you have the money, means they're not going to lose uh, to use money in as much of an unproductive way as it would be uh, if they transferred that to keep SAA afloat for longer. Let's take a step back. ECB now. Right. Mario did give us a stimulus. Yes. But uh, 
Yeah, well, what yes, but give saying? with the one hand, take with the other, as you ah. pointed out. Remember, uh, the deposit rate is now has been moved from minus 0 0.1, in other words, you give them 100 and they give you back 99.9, .9, to minus 0 0.2, give them 100 and they give you back to 99.8. It's difficult to see that that is enriching the general population. <laughs> I don't think it is to any significant extent, but it does say that that is the cost of ensuring the safety of your capital. And I think there's a worldwide move there. Security of capital is more important than the return on that capital. One of the aims of QE in Europe is to yes. weaken the euro. Yes. And I'm sure that even yesterday the ECB were probably thinking that on the 16th the Fed's going to do it for us anyway. Well, perhaps, yes. Uh, I think what we have seen is that although the euro has weakened, largely thanks to monetary policy, um, the, the European exports, European foreign trade, mm. is improving, but it's not booming. It's not a bustling sector at all. So I think that they would rather say that it's a very slow process, but it is having some results. Uh, the last thing I want to ask you about is OPEC. Yes. OPEC is having a meeting this weekend. Right. Within the organization, there's a lot of disgruntlement. Some people want to cut production, but they can't afford to, can they? Well, they need the cash flow. This is it. For over years, they've had their own infrastructure development so that uh, oil is no longer the all-important commodity of these economies because at some stage it's going to run out. Um, and, uh, but what we're seeing is that American technology, I think, is effectively running the show at the moment. They have proved that they can and will produce oil at consecutively lower levels, lower cost levels, and uh, yes, it means that a lot of oil is left in the ground, but they can come back for it if and when the oil price comes up to, back to $50 or higher or wherever it is. Meanwhile, what they're saying is we can carry on producing we will decide what the, where the oil price is going to do. And by doing that, they're sustaining their own industry because their major cost input is kept so low, it makes them competitive, to an extent perhaps offsetting the high dollar, which is, uh, which is negative mm. uh, for their exports. So they've got all these balancing factors. I think the Americans are going to bank on that technology, keeping the oil price lower for longer and perhaps driving out some of the higher cost producers. Mm. OPEC has lost quite a bit of clout, hasn't it? I would say so, yes. Thank you for your time, Ian. Thank you. Well, here we have it. Ian Crookshanks, Chief Economist at the S Institute of Race Relations. That's a mouthful. Um, yeah, OPEC seems like uh, they've got very little choice, do they? That's what happens when you think you're too big. Let's take a break.